having said this, I um, put slides together about very recent work uh, in my laboratory with regard to entropy, symmetry, and dynamics, but actually it connects very beautifully to what Carl just has been talking about and probably also to what has been uh, ongoing here during the day. And I'm taking actually a very similar entry point here, and uh, but with a different emphasis. Uh, uh, so I'm also starting with thoughts of uh, going all the way back to uh, E.T. Jaynes in the 50s and 60s, when he stated uh, his maximum information principle um, represent. Can you see my uh, mouse, Jennifer? Yes. 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 Excellent. Yes. Yeah. So um, in this famous physical review paper stating that there is an unambiguous criterion for the amount of uncertainty represented by a discrete, in fact, probability distribution, agreeing beautifully with our intuition yeah, about uh, 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 uncertainty. Yeah? And where I like to connect this, and this is actually uh, uh, also a work that has been done by James and uh, by Hermann Harkin that Carl has mentioned also, is actually to some of the deterministic features. Yeah that are expressing themselves in shaping the probability distributions that we're dealing with here. And these are the correlations, essentially. This is our access to the world. Deterministic features that are uh, uh, generating dependencies of variables and generally as such are reducing the distribution of the state variables on reduced subspaces yeah, that we can actually measure express themselves as correlations or through other so, uh, through some other uh, functions, but typically in physics we measure them as through correlations, where you have the uh, probability to the actual value, which can be energy, which can be velocity, whatever is uh, measurable. And we have the uh, mean values or the higher order momenta that then enter in to the probability distribution function that uh, where we can actually uh, make enter the deterministic uh, structures through the correlation functions via the Lagrange multipliers, lambda one, lambda two, et cetera. And as such constrain the measure the data sets um, uh, represented through the probability function. Z is a partition function that obviously depends on those. And then we can actually uh, determine the entropic forces um, as a function of the partition function and the parameters alpha yeah, that are parametrizing the uh, to us accessible physical variables f of x. Yeah? In the equilibrium, this is thermostatistics, and I'm just mentioning it here for completeness, where uh, the uh, entropic forces generally uh, in thermostatistics that would be a stress tensor, pressure, uh, electric or magnetic momenta uh, ca can be derived as a function of the parameterizations. Yeah? We spoke of the inner energy temperature in the case of equilibrium statistics. Uh, then, uh, uh, times the entropy uh, leading to an expression of uh, the free energy that Carl has so eloquently spoken to us. Yeah? So let's reduce this uh, in order to be able to emphasize the deterministic features in there. Yeah? Let's reduce it to very simple examples. And the simplest of all would be a one-dimensional flow uh, G of X, which may be generally uh, nonlinear, multi-stable, for instance, but if we here in this example linearize it to a fixed point, which you see represented here, this is a one-dimensional domain. In this case, this is represented as a stable fixed point. You see the flow in its neighborhood being small and then get, uh, going faster uh, further away. So we have linearity and a system like this, we can always write as a potential function dv by dx and the corresponding uh, potential to this very simplistic system is uh, the parabolic function yeah? uh, represented here. And when we compute the corresponding 
stationary probability distribution function p uh, where we have the uh, exponential the lagrange multipliers but this is just a constant which we can always pull into the normalization constant uh, so the normalization of the probability plus lambda times the potential um, eat, uh, the parabolic uh, potential yeah and that provides us with a well-known gaussian uh, distribution so when we go to a higher dimensions the same principles hold yeah here uh, one state variable again linear second state variable uh, and uh, uh, what we can measure as we were able to measure uh, here we can measure mean position we can measure uh, the uh, second momentum which uh, may correspond to a form of energy same thing here but within all the variables plus and this is a point i wish to emphasize the cross correlations that provide us with information about the interactions between the different state variables yeah for the stationary distribution uh, around the fixed point uh, we can again write it in the same form but potential is now two-dimensional but the same principles apply that we uh, can pull up the constant terms into the normalization and then we have quadratic potential quadratic potential and the coupling term uh, in here and we can measure the corresponding uh, um, correlates in the physical world and here if we, we can measure x or higher orders second orders here if the cross coupling is zero we end up with the normal two-dimensional gaussian uh, distribution probability function and the corresponding potential in 2D is represented here. If the coupling between these variables is actually not zero, so the variables, the states, uh, variables are not independent, I'm introducing a, a linear coupling here, a beta term. So in this case, we have beta equals zero. Yeah, essentially nothing changes now. Now we can actually estimate uh, through this ansatz here, the strength uh, for the beta. Yeah, for beta non-zero, and then actually what it does is deforming the uh, corresponding probability density function. Yeah? So this is well known. The beauty thereof is we can do it fully analytically for this particular system, and that actually for a single fixed point uh, in high dimensions, it generalizes to n dimensions. Yeah? And we can actually reshuffle the terms now in this probability distribution function in the following form that we collapse. Uh, we split it essentially into two parts, into a part with the mixed variables and into a part that depends only on the variable y. And actually like this, we can cast it in the form that we know from the Bayes theorem, where you have the conditional probability here, the probability distribution uh, a function of y times the conditional probability providing us with the joint probabilities. Yeah? And what we recover here analytically in this particular case is the free energy expressed in the conditional probability function yeah? which is and for beta equals zero so we are decoupling the degrees of freedom naturally it becomes e to minus x squared and this becomes e to minus y squared so we have two independent cautions as in this case as it should be and this translates of course naturally away from the single uh, uh, fixed point to multiple fixed point here you have the phase flow one stable fixed point another stable fixed point and this would provide us with a, a well-known biquadratic potential and i have not uh, now not plotted this but it would provide us with a double gaussian function with maximum here and another maximum here and this can general, be generalized and uh, be written exactly in the same form in terms of the sta stationary probability function. If, uh, more difficult to do this analytically, but partially possible for some transient forms, we can actually also apply it to general uh, flows on individual manifolds and actually sampling the individual flows. Here an example of a limit cycle, yeah? And here an example of a, a closed trajectory on in a three-dimensional space, in this case on a cylinder. This is actually something that we want to do, which we run into in particular in brain sciences, in real world uh, uh, situations that we are having uh, manifolds still low dimensional 
two or three, four dimensional, um, and in which we have actually flows. Yeah? Like here, see in this one dimensional cases, you see flows where you can have individual subspaces where the flow is constrained. So these are attractive subspaces and with uh, 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 separate receipts that are actually separating these subspaces. And this is typically the type of information that we wish to sample. And there we are running into a very uh, big data related uh, uh, challenges. At the end of the day, as we, uh, as I just uh, demonstrated to you, the deterministic structures are in the deviations on the flow and in the deformations of the flow, and not just locally, but distributed on the manifold that provides us with particular information. So how do these flows, how do they can get generated uh, in uh, a system that is nonlinear based on networks? And here I want to connect to symmetries actually. Yeah? And what we, uh, in uh, Herman's work, Herman Harkin's work in synergetics, he has focused and pushed forward very strongly the proximity to individual uh, points in parameter space. And this is where the proximity to criticality where transition occurs from one ordered state to another ordered state. And that plays without any doubt a very important role because this type of dimension reduction occurs as we just discussed, to a lower dimensional manifolds. There are other scenarios where this can occur. And this is actually in the case of symmetry and when we break the symmetry. So the symmetries are generating actually these very specific uh, areas in state space that allow the reduction of dimensionality. Yeah? Uh, this is known in dynamics as equivariant uh, uh, systems. An example here, imagine you have a two dimensional system and all of these points for x dot equal y dot equal zero, they're composed of fixed points. Yeah, in this case, fx equals zero, we call this a, a null climb. Same thing for fy equals zero, so they are on top of each other. If they are attractive, all the flow goes down to this. Uh, uh, object, uh, which we call a manifold, but the flow on it by definition is zero, unless we don't overlap them perfectly, but there are intersections here at this point and at this point. They remain circular, but with a symmetry breaking. By definition, because this is null client for x equal, uh, dot equals zero, and this is y dot equals zero, it's very slow in the dynamics. When you perform a stability analysis, you will find that it's attracting very fast down to this fixed point, very fast to this fixed point, but the flow goes this way that is being attracted into this domain. So what we have here actually is an attractive manifold in state space, not just one fixed point, not multiple fixed points, but actually uh, in this uh, here, infinitely many. And here with a symmetry breaking, we have a slow manifold. This can be actually generalized. Yeah, oh, sure. let me show you this example here. This is exactly the scenario I just showed you. The corresponding equations for mu equals zero, this system is perfectly symmetric. Yeah, And for little deviations from this, in red, you have the stable fixed points and the flows on it, and then uh, the corresponding dynamics that is uh, evolving uh, and generating a phase flow topology, which is not local, global. That's part I want to emphasize. And when we run the same simulation with noise, it's essentially sampling the manifold. Yeah? And we're getting these beautiful data clouds and we have a time scale separation, slow dynamics on the manifold, sampling this dynamics and fast dynamics, which you, is characterized by being orthogonal to the manifold here, actually going fast uh, down there. Yeah? So fast and slow. Um, we can understand this as follows. As we do in synergetics, we assume a high dimensional network, F, but here um, at the, as a working point, we also assume the f uh, uh, to be on uh, a stationary attractor, Q dot equals zero, but in synergetics, we would say, go on the critical point. Here, we go on the fully symmetric point. And there from uh, Noether's theorem, in this case, we know that actually you can have very infinitesimal shifts along the manifold, which is represented here. 
yeah, along there. And the dynamics and the dynamic system remains actually invariant under these changes. Yeah? Unless you introduce a symmetry breaking. And then as I just showed you in the simulations, you have a dynamics that evolves slowly. Trajectories go fast downwards to the manifold, but it does not alter the dynamics uh, around the manifold. It alters the dynamics on the manifold. You can do this mathematically and generalize it by definition from mu equals zero. You're always zero here. So you have a nice working point. Yeah? And then you can take actually the, uh, the symmetry breaking term, which provides you actually with a flow on the manifold and many uh, small deviations from this, plus the manifold itself is being actually characterized by a movement around the manifold, but because it's nonlinear, this term is actually not a Jacobian or constant, but it is actually a nonlinear expression which provides us with a manifold term as we know it from structured flows on manifolds. Yeah. Um, I'm also checking on my time. Okay. Uh, let me show you a more less trivial situation of this here in a 20 dimensional case. Uh, simulated in 20 dimensions, but the manifold is defined in a three dimensional space. And uh, here itself, it is a sphere, as you see from the mathematics. And mu equals zero provides your perfectly symmetric situation. Yeah? And I can also plot the sphere in there. So then you see it actually uh, uh, better. And then we can break uh, the symmetry and we can uh, generate a certain code, if you wish. Yeah? The, the symmetry breaking happens typically through the connectivity, but you can actually select individual terms and design different types of uh, emergent dynamics that can have different forms. In this case, you have bistability, one fixed point, on the other side, another fixed point, and then it goes down there to the fixed point and the stimulation kicks it out and it crosses on the other side. So we have a manifold, two dimensional span in three dimensional space, living in a 20 dimensional space, where through the symmetry breaking terms, we can actually generate flows on this. Um, uh, in a form that uh, allows uh, different types of behaviors. Yeah? And the, how can we control this? Or how can this be generally controlled in a system like this? This is happening through different highly degenerate forms of symmetry breaking, which means there are many different realizations of that can lead to this type of flows uh, on the manifold. But, this is something, uh, a degeneracy in the parameter space. Here, this distribution is the one that we want to sample in state space. And uh, there are many uh, applications now thereof, in particular in uh, resting state dynamics, where we are sampling the resting state manifolds. But what I'd like to show you is an example from uh, epilepsy, yeah, where the manifolds are highly non-trivial. Uh, uh, still low dimensional and uh, essentially we are using intracranial data in epilepsy patients that are uh, candidate for surgery and here you see a representation of the dynamics let me show this to you a little more dynamically these are uh, stereotactic electrodes so we are sampling from the inside of uh, the brain and you see the pre dynamics and then it involves fast discharges evolves in a spike wave complex to the end and seizure offset. And here, this is coming from a simulation. We can do this. Uh, uh, in blue, you see the sources that are generating the dynamics. We are measuring through these SEG needles, the dynamics, which is actually plotted here, the way we do it actually also in uh, clinical applications. So here we have access to a gold standard data, but uh, through this modeling approach, we can actually also access directly the source data. Yeah? And in terms of manifold, what we are looking at, um, this is here now for the sampling, we, are, we could look at the high detailed frequency discharges here, but what we are looking at is actually at the envelope functions, which are represented here, as I just showed you from the seizure onset, then fast discharges, and then the propagation across the network, as you saw it in the uh, simulation. What we are doing is the following. We are building virtual brains, which are informed by individual patient data, mostly connectivity and anatomical organization. 
we built a brain model that we equip with a generative uh, model for each individual network node. And we juxtapose it to the functional data. And what we want to do is we want to sample the manifolds in the state space, yeah? Exp uh, show, exp uh, exhibiting the type of dynamics as I just showed you, how going on the manifold, following the manifold, uh, the flow on the manifold, exhibiting the particular uh, evolution during the epileptic seizure and then leaving the manifold uh, again in order to provide the clinicians with an estimation of the epileptogenic zone. Yeah. Um, uh, this is what it looks like. The manifold itself, itself looks as follows. This is the resting state dynamics spanned in the state space. We are in the rest. And then offset, sorry, onset, seizure onset. This is, would be representative of the oscillatory dynamics. Yeah. Or if you're just taking the surface of the spiral, this would be in the envelope function. And then seizure offset, bow back. If you project it all on this two dimensional plane, down here, then this is uh, would uh, represent the envelope functions, which is actually the data feature that we are sampling. So resting state and then off into the seizure state and then back again. Here you see experimental data that we are using a Hamiltonian Monte Carlo approach with uh, Stan in order to be able to sample the manifold for different nodes. This one is sampling only the resting state here here, this is in this area. This node undergoes actually a seizure and we're sampling the inter projection of the manifold, I should say. And what we're interested in is the epilepto an estimation of the epileptogenicity parameter, uh, X0, which you see here, where we have the sampled manifold in the seizure. And here, this is the resting state. So this is our target. And then we are using Monte Carlo Markov chain uh, uh, techniques. And let me show you uh, this is essentially the last slide, the results we typically we have about 100 areas, and this is the estimation of the epileptogenic zone, the upper areas represents to uh, the uh, more epileptogenic areas. Uh, uh, and uh, the lower are the healthy regimes, we are estimating this for an, uh, for every single brain region and here you have a zoom, this is actually very recent. My postdoc, Jayan, just sent this to me. You see actually the posterior distributions. Yeah? And uh, I can actually zoom into two areas of the posterior distributions, one here and another nice one, Gaussian, the, where you see here, and this is actually the representation with MCMC. This is maximum a posteriori, which uh, is actually what we use in a clinical trial. And when we use variational inference, so this uh, would be actually the Gaussian approximation thereof. I'm showing this to you to demonstrate actually that multimodality is actually uh, current, something that we're dealing with currently, as you see represented here. And I can pick up one, two, three areas and actually represent the joint distribution here, as you see. And actually, uh, this and that area are both epileptogenic. These are two different uh, three areas that are being plotted. But for this one, along this axis, we are having actually the situation that we have multimodality. And typically, we use MAP to make a decision and pass it on to the clinic, clinician. But this is what the reality looks like, and we have to deal with in real world applications. So, we are running a clinical trial with 400 patients at the moment where this type of technology is being used across 13 reference centers in France. Data are being centralized, patients are being virtualized. Uh, and the results are being uh, sent for the clinical decision making in the individual uh, expert reference centers in France. I'm, I ran out of time. I'm stopping here. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, everyone. Yeah.